You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Hi, I'm Dr. Brenna Hicks, the Kid Counselor, and this is the Play Therapy Podcast where you get a master class in child-centered play therapy and practical support and application for your work with children and their families. In today's episode, I am answering a question from Jeremy. Jeremy is in Illinois. Thank you, Jeremy, for writing in. And he has a question about how to best communicate to parents and teachers and school counselors when you're working with a child. So really helpful question. We all have to face this. And this is something that I feel is one of the greatest difficulties, unless you really are grounded in the theory and you really understand how to articulate what's happening effectively. So We're going to dive in, but I want to read his question first, and then we'll talk through some of the components that I think are relevant. So he shared that he's in Illinois, and he has a six-year-old client who is getting angry and aggressive at school. And the child also has a history of witnessing domestic violence. There are only five sessions in, and he says that they hit resistance phase right on schedule. So those are both really positive components, just as a related aside. If we're only five sessions in and we've already hit resistance, that is a pretty fast pace for the child. So that's encouraging. Okay, so then the question actually is, what is the best way to handle his school counselors calling me and asking for, quote, insight? That's point number one. Point number two In addition to the mom's anxiety emailing me daily reports of all of his so-called misbehavior at school. So that was point number two. And then what can I truthfully say to parents and school staff about how the things the child learns in the play therapy room are likely to transfer to his home life and school life? So really helpful question. I'm really looking forward to diving into this. And then he kind of clarified with one final question. Even if he loves the playroom experience, isn't he still going to be triggered by whatever is upsetting him at school? So I feel like those are actually two separate questions and, I mean, related but distinct. So I'll actually tackle that as well. So let's talk through the three things that I think are relevant here, and then we'll look at each one individually. So we're going to talk through the fix it fast mentality, and that's what I'm gleaning from this email is the school counselors and the mom are trying to fix it fast, and they really want that magic pill that's just going to make all of this go away which doesn't work. So we'll talk about that. Secondly, expectations. I think it's extremely important that we are very clear with expectations when we're dealing with adults in the child's life. So we'll look at what that looks like. And then finally, I think the biggest piece of it is clear articulation about the boundaries and what's happening and why it's happening and what it looks like. And you really have to be able to communicate and articulate so that they understand because they don't and we can't expect them to. So we're going to look at those three components and and kind of tackle these pieces of this question. So, all right. One of the things that I share with parents and even with school staff pretty frequently is we have to think of this in terms of How long did it take us to get here? I will actually ask parents and staff that pretty frequently. So it sounds as though, you know, he's six, so I'm guessing either kindergarten or first grade, and there's anger and aggression at school, but there's also a history of witnessing domestic violence. So the child's understanding of how you handle something when you get angry is you get aggressive because that's what the child saw. So there's a lot of layers here. But what's most important is they are getting angry and aggressive at school, but how long did it take for us to get to this point? I'm pretty sure that this didn't just like pop up out of the blue out of nowhere. How long did the child witness domestic violence? How long has the the child had a history of aggression? Yes, it's happening at school now, but I can almost guarantee you that there's a long range of time here. So when I ask parents and caregivers and and counselors and principals and all these people, how long did it take us to get here? The answer is almost always months, if not years. So then my gentle reply is, well, it's not going to fix itself in a couple of weeks then. 
So they have to understand there is no magic pill. There is no silver bullet. There is no, you know, miraculous fix that just makes this all go away. And the thing that parents and the school staff want more than anything is the child to stop being aggressive, right? Because it's a liability and other kids can get hurt and the child that's actually aggressive can get hurt and it makes a fearful environment and then parents are complaining and then there's lawsuits. And so we get it, right? We have to understand the why. We can't be frustrated that parents and the school are pushing for this to get fixed. We have to understand why. Of course they want it fixed immediately. And we shouldn't have any resentment that they're trying to fix this as soon as possible. However, that brings us to the next point, which is expectations. Because the reality is, everyone in the child's life that's pushing the pace of this and wanting this to get fixed as soon as possible, they need to trust you. They need to trust the process. They need to have some patience that we are working We are managing this. We are learning and growing and developing skills, but it's not going to happen overnight. And so the expectations become, I'm going to give you opportunities to share things with me, but it doesn't need to be every day. I don't need you to call me frequently asking for what they, look, let me pause because this is actually rare. I, my therapists, myself, we rarely, if ever, get schools calling us asking us for insight. So Jeremy, I hope that that actually makes you feel really pleased and and proud that they want to hear from you because it's usually the opposite. We're reaching out to the schools and saying, would you like some insight? Would you like to know what's working and what we're what we're doing so that you can collaborate with us? And it's usually falling on deaf ears. So I'm actually really encouraged that the school counselors are calling you asking for your insight. However, that's not manageable. You can't be at the school's beck and call. You don't want to get an email daily from the child's mom. Okay, so this is about setting expectations. And how you do that is when you get an email every single day with all of this stuff that you don't really need nor want nor care about in in a loving, gentle way, right? I mean, Yes, of course, you want parents to be able to communicate with you, but it doesn't change your work in the playroom. It doesn't change your approach. It doesn't change your theory. You know, whatever happened at school really doesn't play in in what you're going to do in the session. What we have found most effective so that they know you received it, but so they realize that there's going to be no engagement and you're really not all that interested is just a simple, thanks for letting me know, reply. You don't get into it. You don't try to reassure them. You don't try to make them feel better. You don't talk about how all the work you're doing in the playroom is going to be the antidote to what's going on because that is the loop that you get stuck in. If you ignore it completely, then you get an email. Did you get the email that I sent? So we've learned the most effective way to handle it is a one-line reply of thanks for letting me know. And there's no more. And that makes it very clear that you then are receiving it, but not going to engage. You have to tell everyone in the child's life when you are available to speak with them. And so our process is every five sessions with the child, you get an hour meeting with the parent. And that is worked in. That is part of our structure. And so every five sessions, we give you an hour of our time so that you can tell us what's going on. You can give us whatever update you need to give us. And the point is, it's never in front of the child. I mean, thankfully, this mom is emailing you, not trying to tell you in the lobby before you take the child back, because that happens often a lot, too. And we completely shut that down. We don't talk about a child in front of the child, ever. So the fact that she's emailing you, I give her credit for that. But again, I think my gut tells me they don't understand what your boundaries are, what your communication process is, and that just needs to be made clear. So if you say, if unless it's really urgent, unless it's really something important that is kind of a crucial thing that I need to hear immediately... Why don't you make a list and save it for our consultation? 
Why don't you compile things you'd like to talk about when we have our next phone call? That would be with the school. The meeting in person would be with mom. And so if you're setting expectations, they know what you want them to do. But if you just let them email you and let them call you, they're never going to understand that that's too much. And then finally, you have to be able to articulate what's happening in the playroom. Because Jeremy, your question, what can I say to parents and school staff about how the things the child learns in the playroom transfers to his home life and school life? This is what you have to be really good at, which is explaining how it works. So the way we typically acknowledge something like this is the playroom is their practice ground. So I have to practice what it feels like to self-regulate. I have to practice what it feels like to self-control. I have to practice what it feels like to get into a dysregulated state and then be able to get myself back out of it. I have to practice obeying limits. I have to practice being aware of boundaries. And the safety of the playroom provides that practice ground. So what happens is they're working on it. They're dipping their toe in to see what it feels like because new skills are hard. Doing new things is hard. Trying something foreign is hard. So you're essentially dipping your toe in the water, right? Like how cold's the water? So you dip your toe in in the playroom and you see what it's like. And if it doesn't feel awful, you're willing to try it again. And the more you try it in the playroom, the more you end up willing to try it in other environments. So you have to help communicate to parents that they are practicing their skills in the playroom for the carryover into the real world. You don't ever want to try a new skill in the environment you're the most likely to be dysregulated. You try it in a safer space, in a place with no ramifications as well. That's another important distinction. The playroom is safe and it's protected and there's no consequence for failing at anything. So there's safety there. And it's very helpful to help adults know you will often see progress in the playroom before it extends elsewhere. I tell parents that all the time. I will likely see the progress before you do because they're working on it with me first. So then when you have your consultations and when you have your phone calls and your meetings with school staff, you say, look, I'm seeing evidence of the child's ability to self-control. I'm seeing evidence of the child's ability to self-regulate. You will start to see it soon, but they have to feel comfortable with it first, right? So you have to be able to paint big picture for them. And then Jeremy, to the second part of your question, which is even if he loves the playroom experience, isn't he still going to be triggered by whatever's upsetting him in school? I actually am going to re-address that whole thing in a different way because I don't actually think he's being triggered at school. And I, just as a related aside, I actually don't like the word triggered. I think we overuse that. And I think that that has become this buzzword and that's just my bent. So I'm just going to kind of address this from a different perspective because I actually don't think he's being triggered. I think in his school environment, it's the least predictable. And there are too many stimuli. There are too many things that are unknown. There are too many things that he can't control. So when you have a child who gets easily dysregulated, who doesn't have an emotional vocabulary, who has no self-control, is not able to keep anger and aggression in check, therefore, at school, he is having the most difficult time doing those things. But... The playroom is where he works on that. So I don't actually think he's being triggered at school. He would be getting triggered everywhere based on these set of issues. He doesn't self-control anywhere. He doesn't self-regulate anywhere. So, I mean, it seems as though that would be a universal struggle. But I think school is the environment where it is hardest for him to maintain any sense of control over himself. And let's circle back. You mentioned he's getting angry and aggressive. Well, both of those are power plays. Both of those are an attempt at control. He's probably actually not angry. 
He's probably embarrassed or ashamed or disappointed or frustrated or guilty or some other negative emotion that he's masking with anger. And when you feel powerless and out of control, the easiest approach to that is to be aggressive, which makes you feel that you have power and control. So my gut tells me this is not a triggered issue. This is not a school issue. This is just he's having the hardest time there. But he's having a hard time with this everywhere, it sounds like. So it's really important to keep in mind that the playroom experience is his practice ground. And he will inevitably end up being able to put all of these skills that he's acquired in every environment in his life over time. But five sessions in, you can't expect to see a whole lot because he hasn't had enough practice. So Jeremy, thank you so much for your question. I hope that that is helpful to you. And I assume that it would be helpful for everyone because we all deal with those parents and those schools and those adults that are really hungry for information and they really want to be communicative. But sometimes it's challenging finding the balance. And I think that's what we're always after is balance. So kind of wrapping all of that up, We have to make it very clear that it's not a quick process. We have to set clear expectations and boundaries, and we have to clearly articulate. So I hope those are takeaways that you can implement and will be helpful to you in your work this week and in the future. Thank you, as always, for your questions. Every week I do a listener question, so please feel free to email me with something that you've been wondering or concerned about. I'd love to cover it on air. Brenna at thekidcounselor.com. And Play Therapy Now has some coaching opportunities if you are interested in going deeper into the child-centered model, interested in private practice, interested in coming to Tampa to work directly with me. So please check out playtherapynow.com for all of that information. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. Thank you for all of the emails and all of the things that you communicate to me that this is helpful to you, beneficial to you. I've been able to speak with so many of you on the phone that have been interested in the training. And it's just been so encouraging to me that your feedback is that this really is helping your practice and this really is helping your work with kids. That is why I do it. We need really, really grounded, effective child-centered play therapists in the world. There are so many kids that need help. There are so many kids hurting and struggling. And I think that the antidote to that is an entire army of child-centered play therapists that are really, really good at what they do, and they deeply understand this model, and therefore they're the most effective that they can be, and children get the benefit of that. So I'm so grateful. That was a long way to say thank you (laughs) for spending time with me each week. So we will talk again soon. I look forward to it. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.